Welcome to De-Escalating Conflicts, Resolving Problems, and Diffusing Tense Situations. Everyone's job entails resolving conflicts in one way or another. This could be with customers or clients, vendors or suppliers, and most definitely it has to do with coworkers. Resolving those conflicts makes a big difference in terms of creating a positive resolution to any situation. In this training, we'll talk about some commonplace situations as well as those very tense situations that can arise from time to time. The objectives of this session are to learn tips and techniques, learn how to identify and overcome obstacles and resistances to conflict resolution and intervention. We'll learn from adversity and respond appropriately to de-escalate an incident and hopefully build your skills and your confidence in being able to step up and proactively resolve conflicts as they arise. Let's start out with the basics of how to resolve conflicts. This is called the conflict resolution continuum, the various ways we can approach conflicts from passive to aggressive. First, we have avoiding. This style of conflict management is rarely successful except when used to sidetrack an irrelevant issue that becomes distracting to the team. The issue should be handled as a separate issue when the parties are in conflict and they're away from the rest of the team. Examples of avoiding behaviors are ignoring, avoiding, sweeping the problem under the rug, but of course the problem just festers and gets worse if unresolved. However, short term, it's good to sometimes walk away from a problem and avoid it hoping that you can come together at some point and resolve the issue appropriately. The second approach is accommodating by justifying or just accepting the conflict. People who use this technique are in denial that a problem exists and tend to justify or explain away the problem. Their major objective is to smooth over any waves that exist with the team. In the middle is compromising. And this style of conflict management attempts to listen to all viewpoints and come up with a third solution that is a composite of all sides. The compromising type of conflict management is successful for overcoming short-term conflict, but long-term results are generally better handled with a more definitive approach. In compromising, you have to give in something or give up something, and sometimes the person who has to acquiesce goes away being angry and resentful. Where you want to try to work is in a collaborative approach. With collaboration, you're going to derive a mutually beneficial solution. This is an assertive approach that involves the proactive resolution of any situation that exists. You have to listen to each viewpoint and determine the best solution on an objective basis and try to listen to other people's viewpoints using creative problem solving tools, being careful not to assert opinions over the others. If you're overly assertive, that approach is called forcing. It's an aggressive approach that involves making authoritative decisions without consulting with the other team members. It's goal-oriented and decisive. However, long-term, you're going to create resentment if this is the only way that you resolve issues. This technique demonstrates that the leader has very little time to spend debating the validity of other people's opinions and makes decisions based on what they believe is right as opposed to a consensus decision. Generally speaking, you want to try to collaborate and be assertive, but not push the envelope and be seen as being overly aggressive. You also don't want to be passive or passive aggressive in your conflict resolution. Those are inappropriate and often result in resentment, anger, or uncooperative team members. It's important that conflict be addressed and that employees collaborate together. It's not easy to do since many employees naturally are more passive, but problems that are left unattended tend to ruminate and get worse. Therefore, it's important to be assertive and apply the collaboration approach. How to collaborate. First of all, there are steps that you should take and questions that you should ask along the way to ensure that the other person that you're collaborating with is engaged in the conversation. Uncover hidden agendas. You won't know where the person's coming from unless you ask them. 
A lot of times people are hesitant to offer their suggestions about how the problem should be resolved, but you won't know what their perspectives are unless you ask them directly. So ask questions like, what are your objectives or issues? What are you hoping to achieve? This way you'll understand where the other party is coming from and can ensure that your solution addresses those issues. In your questions, look for common ground. Ask what is important to everyone. We all want the same thing. And what are those objectives? This is important in terms of getting everyone on the same page to realize that the problem is being resolved to everyone's benefit. The next step is to brainstorm possible solutions and ask questions like, what can we do to resolve this issue? Or say something like, here's an idea I have, what do you think will work? Or what suggestions do you have? It's important to not say, here's what I think we should do, because the other person might have their own ideas about an appropriate approach. Use appropriate problem solving tools to get to the bottom of the situation and generate a lot of ideas on what could work to resolve this issue. At this point, don't use judgment and try to generate as many ideas as possible. And remember to build on the ideas of others. Someone's idea may result in a idea that no one had considered before. This is where creative problem solving comes into play. Once you have uncovered all the possible ideas that would resolve this issue, you want to systematically evaluate the ideas objectively and then select the best idea. Ask questions, is this the best solution? And what will work for everyone to make sure that everyone is engaged in the process and committed to the outcome? And then get agreement on the details. Ask, are we committed to the solution? And you probably want to follow up with an email to confirm the details of what was decided. Now let's talk about de-escalating a tense situation that has gone beyond our abilities to resolve that conflict. The key is understanding the warning signs. Some of the signs in level one might be behavior that is intimidating or bullying or discourteous or just rude, disrespectful, especially if they make comments about race, religion, or national origin and the other protected categories we talked about, or if you have a person who's just uncooperative and is becoming verbally abusive, that's level one. And those are some warning signs that the situation could get out of hand if you're not careful. Level two is when the situation becomes more escalated, more tense. This is when a person might verbally argue and become more heated in their refusal to obey policies and procedures, or if they sabotage equipment or steal property, if they send threatening notes or leave threatening notes on your car, or sees themselves as a victim. Those are examples of escalated comments and actions that definitely require you to respond in a proactive way. This is really your last chance to de-escalate the situation. Otherwise, we might move to level three, which is going to be resulting in an emergency response, where you would have suicidal threats, physical fights or altercations, destruction of property or other violent displays of aggression, displays of extreme rage, or if someone not just threatens, but actually pulls out a weapon and states they are going to harm others. Those situations require an emergency response. If the situation is escalated to level three, whatever you say and do might not matter to the person. And unfortunately, we have lost the opportunity for de-escalation. This graphic shows the escalation cycle, which is the typical pattern that occurs before, during, and after a tense situation. First, things might appear calm, but a person is triggered by some comment. Then they get agitated, and the tension accelerates. Now, if you can diffuse the stress as it builds up, it won't have to peak, and that's going to be our objective. After the peak, there's a de-escalation, and don't forget about the final post-crisis depletion where you're exhausted and there's a rush of adrenaline 
and you need to recover from that situation. It's important for you to beware of other people's behavior when you're at work and read the signals that people send you that let you know about their mood or their emotional state. Some of the behavioral warning signs that might indicate potential violence from a coworker, customer, or the general public. Some examples are intimidating behavior towards others, a fascination with weapons or violent acts, an inability to accept constructive criticism on job performance, exhibiting moral righteousness and believing the employer is not following law, rules, or policies, displaying unwarranted anger and displaying violence towards inanimate objects, throwing items around or stomping on something would be examples of that, demonstrating paranoid behavior or unreasonably holding a grudge, usually against a supervisor. It could be extreme mood swings or extreme family, financial, or other personal problems. Stealing or sabotaging equipment. Displaying an obsession about their job and not usually having outside interests. Or it could be excessive complaining that appears to be irrational. And drug or alcohol use, especially an increased use, might indicate a warning sign for potential behavioral issues. Remember, it's normal to feel defensive and annoyed at people who aren't behaving in a professional or respectful way. But we can't control other people's behavior. We can only control our response to their bad behavior. We also really never know what's going on with people, and so there may be underlying issues that we need to consider. Also, we can do our best to maintain our professionalism and try to reduce the tension and emotion, but sometimes things will get out of hand, and so we just have to be careful about that and accept the reality. There are three steps for determining the appropriate action. The first step is to be aware at all times when you are out with the public or dealing with customers directly. A lot of times people are distracted, they're on their phones, they're talking and texting, they're returning emails at the same time, they're having a conversation, and they may not be fully aware of their surroundings. Pay attention to what is going on around you. The second step is to determine the best response. Have the courage and confidence to do something, but never put yourself in harm's way. Help can be direct or indirect. Directly address the situation or step in and say or do something that will help resolve the current conflict. Once you've determined the best response, then you can take action. Sometimes it's hard to tell if someone is in need of help. Err on the side of caution and investigate to determine the best response. Don't be sidetracked by ambiguity, conformity, or peer pressure. Who should take action? Well, basically you have three choices. You can either respond individually on your own, team up with someone else to distract and delegate, or delegate the situation to someone in an authoritative position. If you're going to respond individually, be courageous and step up. If you see something, say something. But this does require personal assertiveness. If you don't say anything, your silence is licensed to continue that behavior. Oftentimes, it helps to team up with someone to distract and delegate. Get another person on board to interrupt what's going on, whether it's harassment, bullying, inappropriate behavior, or a person who's acting out. Make sure that you're not going it alone and you're teaming up with a person who can assist and support you. In some cases, you want to avoid and ignore and walk away. And this would require that you call someone in to attend to the situation, whether it was the police, a supervisor or manager, an HR person, or someone else in an authoritative position. Now let's talk about the ways you want to respond in case you are confronted by a troubling situation. Anytime we encounter a person who is acting in an irrational, volatile way, their emotion is high and their logic is low. 
it sounds very simple, but what you want to try to do is reduce emotion and raise logic. That way you're leveling the playing field and giving yourself an opportunity to interact with a person in a rational way. Here are some steps you can take in order to reduce the emotion. In terms of body language, make sure that you're calm, polite, and respectful. Speak softly but firmly. Try to maintain eye contact without staring at the person. Certainly avoid threatening gestures, your clenched fists, or power stances, and try to calm the person down with your positive tone of voice, uh, with your calm demeanor. From a verbal standpoint, you can lower emotion and raise logic by speaking with confidence and being deliberate in the words you choose. Be sure to say please and thank you. Use the person's name to get their attention. Use words like let's, we, together, which demonstrate support and working together to resolve the situation. Provide options to the person to get them to make their own decisions so they feel more in control, if this is possible. We'll talk about some ways to do this in the scenarios. From a nonverbal standpoint, make sure that you are maintaining a safe distance of about five to seven feet. Get permission to move closer. And if you can, have the person sit down if possible. Throughout your conversation with this person who's acting irrationally, you should try to maintain that balance because the minute the situation gets too emotional, logic goes out the window. But you also can't be like a machine, an automaton. You have to demonstrate compassion, empathy, and a calm professional demeanor. So when you're intervening in a conversation that may be escalating, you want to calm the person down by saying things like, can we please not do that? Or less emphatic, let's keep it professional. However, you may want to escalate your own response to the situation by being more direct and emphatic by saying something like, stop acting that way, or leave that alone, or cut it out. Depending on the situation, you may want to escalate your voice and the words you use to be even more direct and emphatic. However, it depends on each situation. And of course, if you suspect something, say something, and the sooner the better. Waiting until the situation has escalated will not help. You're probably past the point of no return. And so if you can diffuse small minor issues before they build up, that's going to result in better solutions for any conflict that you encounter. But certainly contact your manager or supervisor, human resources, the police, or another person of authority who can assist as the situation escalates. However you decide to intervene, don't put yourself in danger or any other person, whether it's a coworker or a member of the general public. Don't leave a coworker alone in a questionable situation. Don't intervene on your own. If the situation is questionable, team up with another person to address the situation. Don't ignore, avoid, sweep it under the rug, or make a cynical joke about the situation. Also, don't remain silent or stand by if there is something you can do safely to intervene. And also, don't assume someone else will intervene. Take it upon yourself and your partner to come up with an appropriate response. Actions to take in response to the situation are to use your organization's incident reporting process. If it's a complaint you want to make to HR or if it's escalated to the police, Follow those investigation procedures appropriately and monitor the situation to avoid further escalation or retaliation. Some final thoughts. We should expect disturbances and discomfort sometimes. There certainly has been a decline in courteous behavior in the general public. And so we should expect that people are going to behave in impatient and sometimes disrespectful ways. So use it as a learning experience. We don't always know what is going on with people. They may have medical issues. They may have personal issues. They may have other issues that we just don't know about. And so we should give people the benefit of the doubt 
and try our best to maintain our professionalism, regardless of the situation that we encounter. Try not to take it personally, if possible. Sometimes it is difficult, but if we can take the high road and maintain our composure, that's going to result in a better situation. Remember, don't go it alone. Use your internal resources, whether it's your supervisor or manager, human resources, or the police. If you do encounter a stressful situation, remember that afterwards it could be quite stressful and could be taxing on your mental and physical health. So decompress, take it easy, work through the issue by talking to a coworker or your supervisor, and make sure that you are practicing self-care so the stress that you encounter does not take over and affect your physical or mental health. In summary, practice constant vigilance. Be aware of your surroundings and notice what's going on. Watch the warning signs that are presented to you. Remember to report any suspicions to prevent a situation from occurring in the first place. But respond according to the situation that's presented to diffuse stress and lower emotion. As emotion rises, logic will decrease. So you need to keep that in balance. Remember to use your resources, such as your supervisor and managers, human resources, as well as the police. Thank you for participating. This has been a presentation of Eye to Eye Workplace. The topic was de-escalating conflicts, resolving problems, and diffusing tense situations. That concludes the first part of the module. For the remainder of this module, as well as access to 24 other management topics, visit i2iWorkplace.com. You can even take a certification test and receive a certificate of completion. It's easy and cost-effective to offer a comprehensive suite of online training programs for managers and staff. Visit i2iWorkplace.com. Thank you.